No? Some of the people recognized him and they began shouting, This is Adi ibn Hatim. And a crowd gathered around him. He's a famous guy. His father's Hatim, a Ta'i. And people gather around him. And uh, they take him to the Prophet that this is Adi, this is Adi. And he walked into Medina without any protection. So he, there is this sense of, yeah, and he, nobody's going to hurt me, I'm the son of Hatim basically, right? He has this notion. And he's correct in that he does have that honor and privilege. After all, his sister was freed merely because... Her father was, was Hatim. So he just walked into Medina without any protection. And the people, some of them recognized, they start gathering around him, they take him to the Prophet ﷺ, and they say, this is Hatim, uh, Adi ibn Hatim. So the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ya Adi, aslim to slim. O oh, Adi, accept Islam, you shall be safe. Meaning it will be better for your deen and your dunya. And Adi said that, I already have a good religion that I follow. Meaning I'm a Christian. And at the time, both the Yahud and the Nasara, they felt themselves what? Superior to the pagans. And they were, and they are, even in our Sharia they are, right? They felt themselves superior. So it's as if he's telling the Prophet, why would I want to embrace your faith? I'm not a pagan, go preach to the pagans. I already have a civilization and a religion that I'm a part of, right? So the Prophet repeated, Aslim to Slim. And he said the same thing, that I am... Uh, uh, a person that already has a religion. He said it for a third time. And Adi said this for the third time. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Adi, ana a'lamu bidinika minka. This is a classic line from the seerah. Oh Adi, I know your religion better than you know your religion. Meaning what? I know Christianity better than you think you know Christianity. I know the message of Jesus Christ. Better than you. That's like this, you understand the ta'wah he's giving him, right? I know your religion better than you know your religion. And then he said, and to demonstrate this, this is a very interesting point here. To demonstrate this, he said, are you not the leader of your people? And he said, yes. The Prophet said, do you not take one-fourth of their income in taxes? He said, yes. The Prophet said, and do you not know that your own religion forbids you to do this? Meaning he is showing him, no, you're not even following what you know to be true. And I know this. And this is a very powerful, you know, da'wah scene with the Prophet that really demonstrates his knowledge really of, of uh, the ways and the customs of the people. He's demonstrating to Adi that you are not even following what you know to be Christianity. How about I and I know more about Christianity than you? So Adi said, I became embarrassed, khajilt. I became ashamed that he has a point here. And I knew that he was a prophet because the very fact he just immediately picks on my hypocrisy. That I claim to be a Christian, but I'm not following the teachings of Jesus Christ. I knew him to be a, a prophet. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ then held him by the hand and took him to his house. And Adi is narrating this. That on the way to his house, an old lady with a toddler stopped him and began talking to him to get some help and whatnot. So the Prophet ﷺ stopped in the road and he continued talking with her until her need was taken care of. Adi says to himself, This man is not a king. This man is not a king. For him to stop when he has me, in, and of course he knows who he is, he knows his rank and privilege. And that is, he is the son of, of Hatim al Ta'i. So he says, This man is Laysa bi Malik. This is not a king. Then we arrived at his house, he says. And he took out an old, worn uh, mat. And he picked it up and put it under me. And he said, Sit. But I was embarrassed because that was the only mat in the room. And if I sat on it, he wouldn't have anything to sit. So I said, No, rather, you sit. And he insisted, no, you will sit. So I sat down on the mat. And the Prophet ﷺ sat down on the sand. This is in his own house. And he only has one mat to sit on. right? And he then said to me, Do you know of any other God besides Allah? And Adi said, no. There is no God other than Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Do you know any who is more mighty and powerful than Allah? Adi said, no. Then the Prophet said, Verily, إِنَّ الْيَهُودَ مَغْضُوبٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَالنَّصَارَ ضَالُّونَ That the Yahud are maghdub and the Nasara are misguided and, uh, and uh, incorrect in, in what they believe. 
And then he said, and this is we're gonna come, we're gonna dissect this this da'wah, this entire conversation, inshaAllah we'll dissect it in a while. Then he said, Perhaps you are not accepting Islam because of the state of the people around me, meaning political weakness, poverty, like Adi is a Christian, and Adi has contacts with the Roman Emperor, and Adi is now living next to the Roman Empire. So he is now connected with the premier civilization of the world. And Adi is now coming and seeing the Muslims of Medina, who at this stage still don't have that civilization. So the Prophet said, perhaps you are not accepting Islam because of the state of the people around me. Have you heard of Al-Hira, which is a city uh, in Yemen? He said, yes, I have heard of it, but I haven't been there. The Prophet said, verily, it's only a matter of time before a lady will leave Al-Hira wanting to do tawaf in Mecca and not having any company to protect her. And she will not be scared of anything other than, if you like, the wolf or her f- uh, flock or something of this nature. And it is only a matter of time before the treasures of Kisra, Khusro, will be distributed amongst us. At this Adi said, Kisra ibn Hurmuz, the, the emperor of, of, of the Sassanid, the, the Persian Empire, and the Prophet said, Kisra ibn Hurmuz. And it is only a matter of time before a person will go around the streets of Medina asking for somebody to take sadaqah and he will not find a single person wanting to take sadaqah. Adi is narrating this hadith. It is a hadith. Uh, Adi is narrating this hadith and he said, Wallahi, I have seen two of these three things. <coughs> Which of these two has he seen? The lady, this, the peace and security of the Muslim land. That from Yemen, which is the furthest point down south, right? The point is like the furthest city down south will go all the way to Mecca and she is so confident that nothing will harm her that there's no fear even for her. So the political stability he's talking about. Then the wealth. So the number one is political stability. Number two is the wealth. You're worried about the poverty? We will be distributing the treasures of Kisra. And Adi says... I was of those who participated in the battle against uh, Al-Mada'in. And Al-Mada'in is Tesifon, which is the, the capital of uh, the Sassanid kingdom. These are, to this day, if you go to Persia, there is this Tesifon, there is the city that is tourist resort. And you see these beautiful pillars, like literally, you know, 50 feet, or not even 50, 100 something feet. I mean, massive pillars in the middle of the desert. You see the palaces of the Kisra. To this day, it is a world UN heritage site to this day. And Adi says, I was of those who participated in the Fatah, in the conquest of Madain. And he goes, as for the third, then I know what's going to happen. Wallahi, it's just a matter of time. And of course, we know it did happen, and it will happen again. It happened once, it'll happen again. As for it's happening once, it happened in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, famous year, that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz uh, basically secured the entire financial uh, affairs of the kingdom, of, of the uh, Umayyad empire, to such an extent that there were no poor people to accept sadaqah and zakah. This only happened once, but it is an ideal that Allah demonstrated it is possible. Right? And it will happen again in the time of the Mahdi. It will happen again in the time of the Mahdi that the Mahdi will also want to give uh, zakat and sadaqah and nobody will need any zakat and uh, sadaqah. So Adi then embraced Islam. Now, the story is very interesting for so many reasons. Look at first and foremost the manners of the Prophet ﷺ. His humility, his humbleness. This is what opened up the heart of Adi to Islam initially. This man can't be a king. Also look at Adi already had two clear perspectives. He's either a king or he's a prophet. He's an intelligent man. Him and his sister have understood that there must be one of the two. Because he's conquering the Arabian Peninsula. So he either wants political ambition and power or he's correct in what he is saying. And being with the Prophet for five minutes and he rules out this man is not a king. Look at that. Just imagine. He rules out this man is not a king. Now notice as well, the Prophet ﷺ then opens up the theological angle. After demonstrating the akhlaq, which he doesn't need to show off, he's doing this, right? This is what the Prophet ﷺ is demonstrating, his akhlaq. He doesn't need to show Adi what he is, this is who he is. Then he begins the theological debate. Simple and to the point. Of them is, I know your religion better than you. Right? And wallahi, we as Muslims can use this line, that we are following the teachings of Jesus better than you are. We are following the teachings of Jesus better than you are. The actual message of Jesus, we are obeying it. And you can even bring the most obvious examples. Jesus was 
a practicing Jew. He lived his life according to the laws of the Torah. <coughs> he never ate pig. He was circumcised. He, you know, he prayed and, and, and fasted. This is something that is acknowledged by them. Who amongst humanity still does this and believes in Jesus? We're the only people who do this. Then we go on with other theological points as well. Also he mentions, after basically praising Allah, and this is human fitrah. What person of religion will say, is there any God besides the one God who created you? Is there anything greater than God? Why would you worship anything greater or other than God? So Adi acknowledges La ilaha illallah. Not by saying it, but by concept. Right? And this is again, very simple if the person is sincere, and he's a believer in a God, then you tell him, is there any other being worthy of worship besides Allah? Besides God, whatever name he knows. And of course he will say no. And then of course, after this, now here's where it gets a little bit controversial, politically incorrect, that the Prophet ﷺ criticized the theology of the other religions. The Yahud are maghdub, and the Nasara are misguided. And he said this very clearly. And the reason why he is doing this is because you have to prove the correctness of one faith by disputing the correctness of the others. You cannot really have a theological debate except by refuting the theology of other faith traditions. And uh, this is very touchy in interfaith dialogue in our times that many interfaith dialogues, they don't want to talk about the fact that, oh, uh, each one of us believes we are correct and the other one is wrong. In fact, there's a trend now to say we're all good and we're all okay. And last week when I was in Boston at, at Harvard, this is really one of the points I brought up is that uh, as we're giving interfaith, let us not shy away from the difficult controversies. Let's not ignore, I mentioned the elephant in the room, I said, right? And, this, uh, and the biggest elephant in the room is really about salvific exclusivity. This is awkward, but it needs to be said. And once it is said, so then you understand now, uh, you know, what the issues are. And I, I talked about that from an academic perspective, but it doesn't make any sense to say that all religions are valid when every religion has beliefs that the other deems to be blasphemous. We as Muslims do not believe in Jesus Christ as being the only way for salvation, as being the, the, uh, you know, the Lord and the Redeemer and the Savior. This destroys the fundamental premise of Christianity. And it is understood that a Christian person would view us as being outside the fold of salvation. Because for him, his entire faith rests on believing the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins. Right? And we don't believe this. So why is it problematic for him to say this? I don't find it problematic at all. Quite the contrary. If he didn't say this, I would say, what type of religion do you believe in? Like if you think that my beliefs are totally okay, then you should be believing what I'm believing. Why are you, you know, being politically correct in this way? So we need to be very clear when we have interfaith, not dialogue, but, but when we get more than just dialogue, because there's, there's dialogue and then you go to debate. And uh, when you debate, you do need to get to the awkward issue. That look, we will respect your position in this world. And that's your position. And you have every political right to hold it. But we don't agree with it morally. And we don't agree with it theologically. And we believe that this position is not accepted to our Creator. And we expect Him to say the same thing about us as well. And that's basically a part of this interview. So the Prophet was very explicit that he does not agree with the theology of the Yehud and the Nasara. And he mentions that they are not uh, correct. Then, once he realizes that Adi understands him, now he jumps to the impeding factors. Why is Adi not a Muslim? He gets right to the core of it. Perhaps you are judging Islam by our socio-economic or socio-political status. And this is so relevant, my dear brothers and sisters. Why is this relevant? Because how many are the people that know the theology of Islam is very logical, but then they look at the modern Muslim world. They look at, where does one begin? Boko Haram. Huh? They look at third world. They look at backwardness, education, this and that. And they're so turned off, like, how can this be correct? And there's nothing illogical about that frame of mind. Adi has it right here. You see what I'm saying? Adi has it right here. And our Prophet ﷺ is basically negotiating with him. Perhaps you are not a Muslim because of what you see of the situation around. Then he tells him, look, you're worried about money? We'll get all the money in the world. You're worried about political stability? And he just counters each one of these arguments in a very logical and rational manner. And in our times as well, therefore, there's nothing wrong with 
mentioning the realities of our history, our religion was not anti-science. We might be third world now, by and large, but, at the, but we were not third world for all of our history. Rather, the fact of the matter is most of our history weren't third world. We were the leading you know, uh, contenders in science and technology. And no doubt, so the reason I say this is as follows. We have two extremes as usual. We have two extremes as usual. We have those who consider these aspects of our religion to be the main emphasis of da'wah. Science and technology and middle ages and alchemy and algebra and all this and all that, whatever we did. We invented zero. We didn't invent zero. We got it from the Indians, by the way. But that's okay. Uh, we'll let you guys have it. Alhamdulillah. So glory goes to Islam. No problem. Uh, but it's all fine. But this is not the main point of our religion. The main point of our religion is theology. And we should not have this inferiority complex that we need to prove to them that Islam is all about science. No, Islam is primarily about the worship of Allah. That's one extreme. You have the other extreme that if you ever mention anything of this nature, they say, oh, we don't have to give da'wah through any of this. Our da'wah is only through tawheed and the kalima and whatnot. But here's our process in giving da'wah through socio-political factors. And there's nothing wrong for us with our heritage, our history, to go back and show the people this is what our faith tradition was, this is what we accomplished, and mention whatever else needs to be mentioned as long as it is legitimate and uh, true. And uh, also, by the way, from the story of, of Adi, we also find how culturally aware, how psychologically sensitive the Prophet was to be able to judge Adi so quickly. And obviously this is a miracle from Allah, but he's basically reading Adi, and he's leading him along, you know, uh, to, the, to the process, the thought process of, why are you not a Muslim? Is it theological? Is it this? Is it that? Until finally Adi finds nothing to stop him from accepting Islam, and Adi eventually does uh, accept Islam. And... Adi visited the process multiple times, and uh, in one of these visits, he asked a very important question that we should all memorize and use when we need to use it. It's a very interesting hadith that Adi ibn Abi Hatim he said, "Ya Rasulullah, my father used to be good to his relatives and be generous with the people, and do this and do that. Shall he be rewarded?" So Hatim al Ta'i the most generous of all Arabs. The legend of generosity, the legend of karam, the legend of hospitality, he is being asked about by his son, Adi. And the Prophet responds in a very profound statement. Your father desired something, and he got what he desired. And that's the hadith. Your father desired something, and he got what he desired. And that hadith is in Ibn Hibban, and it is authentic according to Shu'ib al Anul it's Hassan. And what did he desire? Fame. Hatim al Ta'i wanted fame, or you can say prestige, or love, or shuhra. He wanted shuhra. And he got it to the level that 14 centuries later, the Arab world, bi ajma, knows of Hatim al Ta'i to this day. Think about that. He was generous. And he wanted something. And he got it. And this is an excellent hadith to use when people who are very beloved to mankind, but who do things not for the sake of Allah, they die. Whether they are Nobel laureates, or they are princesses, or they are whoever they are, they did something, for whatever reason they did it. And they got what they desired. And as for the Akhirah, تِلْكَ الدَّارُ الْآخِرَةُ نَجْعَلُهَا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُرِيدُونَ عُلُوًا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فَسَادًا This the Daru Al-Akhirah is given to those who don't want the fame, who don't want, you know, to rule over. As for the Akhirah, Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ Whoever wants the Akhirah, and he strives for the Akhirah, while he's a believer in Allah, that is the one his reward will be given to him. And wallahi, there's nothing embarrassing about this. When a person did not do good for the sake of Allah, why should Allah reward him? Very simple. It's very simple, nothing illogical at all about it. When a person did not do good for the sake of Allah, let him go get his reward for whatever he did, and he shall get it. And they have gotten it.
This is Hatim al Ta'i and this is Fulan and Fulana, whoever they might be. People love and respect them. They become legends in this dunya. But in the Akhirah, they didn't do it for the Akhirah. So as we said, this is the conversion of Hadi uh, ibn Hatim, and he lived a long life, and he died uh, after the conquest of Iraq, after the conquest of uh, Madain, after the battle of Safin, one of the oldest of the Sahaba to die. He lived a full life before Islam, then he lived a full life after Islam, uh, more than 120 years old. Very quickly, we want to f- finish off some events, because next time we will try, inshallah, the battle of Tabuk. Very quickly, in this year as well, in the eighth year of the Hijrah, some very interesting things happened very quickly of the personal life of the Prophet ﷺ. There was a marriage, there was a divorce, there was a death, there was a birth. In the house of the Prophet ﷺ. There was a marriage, a divorce, a death, and a birth. As for the marriage and divorce, it is one of the most bizarre stories and frankly um, inexplicable to be honest. Um, and the only reason I mention it is because I don't want to not mention something of the seerah that is so well known, but it is only well known to students of hadith and what not. The general Muslim population is not aware of the story because it truly is bizarre, but I only mention it because of the fact I don't want to be accused of not mentioning something that is well known. Right? This is an advanced seerah class, as you know. Uh, what happened was that the Prophet proposed to a lady by the name of Fatima bint al dahak from the tribe of the Kulab, and... Uh, there's an ikhtilaf about her names. There's at least six or seven opinions about the name. And when uh, when uh, the process entered in upon her, the, the, marriage, the, the night of the marriage basically, uh, she, for some reason, said, A'udhu Billahi Mink. I seek Allah's refuge from you. From the process. I seek Allah's refuge from you. So the Prophet said, لَقَدْ عُذْتِ بِعَظِيمِ إِلْحَقِي بِأَهْلِكِ you have sought refuge in one who is very great. Go back to your family. And so the marriage was not consummated. So the marriage took place, and then before the consummation, he divorced her by saying, Il haqi bi ahliki. Now, why did this occur? It is unclear because, frankly, these things are not recorded. Why? You know, you don't record these personal things. Even in your own household, if there's some scandal that took place in your generation, it's just not recorded. Why did she say this? What would possibly have... So there's like a number of theories. One theory is that she was mental. Even Hajar mentions that, so she was a little bit you know, mental. Others say that this was a plot that some of her jealous relatives told her. That when the Prophet ﷺ comes in, this is what you're supposed to say. And she was jahila in this regard. She didn't understand. But when she said, أعوذ بالله, meaning this is a very big thing. So the Prophet said, you have sought refuge in Al-Azim. Okay, khalas, you, want, you, you, want, you don't want me, then khalas, go back to your family. So uh, he sent her back to her family. Uh, whatever the case might be, clearly Allah did not will that she become one of our mothers. And this was how it was averted away. And later on she would say, I am the miskina, I am the, the, the you know, how unfortunate am I? that I chose this dunya over the Prophet ﷺ, and she regretted this till she died. Uh, but she was not, she was technically married, but the divorce took place the same night, right? The same night as the marriage, literally, uh, without any consummation. This also shows us a number of things, and that is that uh, it is allowed to divorce in indirect language. This is called an indirect divorce. You have two types of divorce, talaq, uh, salih talaq and kinaya. And this is kinaya. Kinaya means you, you, you say something that has double meanings and you intend divorce. The Prophet did not want to use the word divorce. So he said, go back to your house or go back to your family. And that was divorce. Also, by the way, one of the reasons I do raise this point is because there is this myth uh, that the Prophet never divorced. This is not true. This is simply not true. And I say this because, unfortunately, there is a stigma in the Muslim community attached to divorcees. And this stigma has no basis in the sunnah whatsoever, in the Qur'an or sunnah. And it is amazing that this stigma exists because the majority of the Prophet ﷺ were divorcees. In fact, all of them other than Aisha. Right? As we all know, there is a stigma attached to the very notion of divorce. That divorce is inherently evil, and anybody who undergoes it, the two parties must be bad, or one of them must be bad, and especially the woman must be bad. All of this has no basis. And I want to emphasize this point, that our Prophet ﷺ divorced. And this wasn't the only divorce. We'll come to it inshallah later on, but he divorced Hafsa. 
and Hafsa was in her iddah. And Jibreel came and said, take her back. And so he took Hafsa back. Because Allah said that she's going to remain your wife. So he took her back. So the stigma that we as a culture have for divorce really needs to be erased and cleansed. There's nothing wrong. Sometimes couples just don't get along. Okay, khalas. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean one of them are bad. Sometimes personalities don't match up, right? We already talked about the very sensitive Usama ibn Zayd and, and Zainab. We already talked about that, right? Uh, uh, sorry, Zayd and Zainab, not Usama. Zayd and Zainab. We already talked about this, right? That, okay, they're both great Sahaba, Sahabiyat, excellent. They just didn't get along. And it's not, it's not evil in and of itself to not get along. And sometimes it's just better for the couple to move on. So here, uh, I just wanted to clarify this point. This was the marriage and the divorce. As for the death, in the household of the Prophet that was Zainab. Eighth Hijra Zainab. As for the birth, come on. Should have given you I said a death and a birth. The birth is Ibrahim. He's gonna die in the ninth year of the Hijra. Right now we're still in the eighth. Right? So the death was Zainab. Zainab. Zainab bint Muhammad. Remember, Zainab is his eldest daughter. How old is Zainab? When was she born? Come on, this is... When was Zainab born? Ten years before the da'wah. Ten years before the da'wah. So, Zainab is now, quickly... 31, 32 years old. Yeah. Ten years before the da'wah. Uh, and so at this time when she passed away, now, what was the cause of Zainab's death? She fell down from the camel at the hijra, And she never recovered from the bleeding. That whatever cause, remember the Habbad ibn al-Aswad, we talked about him. The Habbad dynasty also of India, we talked about that as well. right? That she, she was injured, she fell off the camel, and that bleeding never quite recovered. And so for eight years basically, she is in pain and suffering until she passes away uh, in this year. And... Uh, we all know that three of the four daughters of the Prophet died in his lifetime. Uh, Zainab uh, was the second to die. I'm going to have to look this up. The first was Ruqayya, then Zainab, then Umm Kulthum. Even though the chronological order, Zainab is the eldest. Then it is Ruqayya, then it is Umm Kulthum. But uh, I, I, I want to be 